So next we'll hear from the, uh, Dr. Julian uh, Wolfson, who is an associate professor in the School of Public Health at the University of Minnesota. Let me bring this up here. Um, Dr. Wolfson's uh, research lies at the intersection of uh, causal in, uh, inference, inference and uh, machine learning, particularly uh, as applied to large, messy data sets. He has applied uh, methods to problems such as uh, finding uh, surrogate uh, endpoints in clinical trials, uh, identifying the relevant exploratory variables in the presence of uh, correlation and measurement error. Uh, predict, uh, predicting the at risk of heart attacks using electronic health recording, record da record data and understanding human behavior patterns using smartphone sensor data. Dr. Wolfson's uh, presentation this morning is titled Behavior, Time Use, and COVID-19 Exposure in Healthcare, uh, healthcare Workers. As we all aware that the frontline health, uh, healthcare workers uh, have faced unpredictable unpredict predictable and stressful working conditions during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, he will share with us his finding and how healthcare workers' behavior, time, use, and emotional state evolved during the pandemic. Uh, Dr. Wolfson. Well, thanks very much. And uh, before I begin, I just want to uh, extend uh, a welcome to you all again, sort of to echo what Yingling has, uh, has said before. Um, you know, I've been working on this project for over a decade now, and it's just exciting to see that we've been able to sort of extend the reach and the impact of what we've done. Uh, you know, from the from the initial small meetings in a in a conference room at the Humphrey School uh, to this kind of event has really been quite an amazing uh, an amazing journey. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is, you know, Yingling mentioned briefly that this is really about sort of community building, and I think that, that that's totally true. One of the things that we like to say about Dynamica that is that it's it's built by researchers for researchers. And we feel really strongly about trying to create a community of practice around the use of this technology. Um, and I think we have sort of a unique opportunity to uh, to develop this technology in partnership with, with you. So especially as we go forward uh, through this morning and then also through this afternoon, we want this to be not only uh, communication of how people are how, how people are using this technology, but also get your feedback about how we can make the technology better and better serve your needs. And in some sense, I think that the role that I see for this community is to helping is to help shape um, the way that this technology can get used and really uncover some novel applications um, in practice. Okay, so all that being said, uh, I'll move on to what I'll be talking about today, which is this project on behavior, time use, and COVID-19 exposure in healthcare workers. I think the COVID-19 pandemic has really um, shone a spotlight um, and made people pay a lot more attention to their daily lives because a lot of people's daily lives have been substantially disrupted by the pandemic. And Dynamica provides an interesting platform to try to understand some of those differences in behavior. And one of the groups whose behavior was impacted perhaps in a different way uh, than the general population is healthcare workers. And so I'm going to be talking about this study um, involving, involving healthcare workers. So just a quick disclosure slide. So uh, unlike the two previous speakers who have been sort of only users of Dynamica technology, I am actually involved in Dynamica. So just so everyone is aware of that, but I also, my primary role is um, in this presentation and also um, in my job is uh, in my affiliation at the University of Minnesota. Okay, so let me tell you just a little bit about um, this healthcare workers study. Uh, one of the things, again, that's different about this presentation than the previous two presentations is that I was not the lead on the study that I'm talking about today, and that has sort of several implications. I'm going to be focusing on what biostatisticians like to talk about, which is sort of study execution and design more so than study results. Um, this study was a study that was actually led by uh, two faculty members, one Dr. Jane Fulkerson in the School of Nursing and Ryan Demmer in Epidemiology. Um, and one thing that's going to become important as we go through and talk about uh, the rest of this project is that the entire project was designed um, and then deployed and started within about four months um, as a co in response to a COVID rapid response call for applications. Uh, this is going to become important later because I'm going to talk about some of the things that I think I, I, I wish we had done differently in some data collection decisions. And a lot of those were down to the fact that we simply had to put this together very quickly. 
So the goal of the project was to understand the behaviors, well-being, and potential exposure patterns of healthcare workers during the COVID-19 pandemic, because one of the things that can be hard to gather uh, about healthcare workers is just how much exposure they're having, because we just didn't have good ways up until usage of a te te technique like Dynamica to understand how much people were working, how much they were at home, how much they, they were out in the community, and how any of those patterns might respond to um, their own personal health and also COVID-19 uh, the COVID-19 rate in the community. So the general design of the study um, was we recruited of roughly 200 healthcare workers at a large local health system. Um, the participants were asked to report COVID-19 symptoms every 14 days and then complete the so-called Mini-Z uh, burnout survey. So there's actually an existing survey called the Mini-Z that measures stress and burnout in healthcare workers. I'm gonna show you on the next slide some of the questions of those things. And so the original study was sort of designed around this kind of primary data collection goal. And again, in contrast with some of the previous studies that, we've, that you've seen so far uh, presented, in those studies that you've seen presented so far, uh, Dynamica was kind of a central piece of the data collection process, right? The questions were designed around the, data, the Dynamica data collection technology. In this study, Dynamica was sort of more of an add-on. It, it was a much lighter footprint, much more passive data collection. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the challenges involved in having Dynamica involved, used in that way. So in this study, it was really sort of an add-on beyond these kind of primary data collection measures uh, that were used. So just to show you uh, what the mini Z score looks like, this is the questionnaire. You can see there's questions about job satisfaction, questions about burnout, questions about uh, stress, et cetera, et cetera. So you, you can sum up, there's actually more questions on the survey than this, but you can sum those up to get some sort of overall measure of uh, stress associated with uh, these healthcare workers' jobs. So a few words about the involvement of Dynamica in this study. As I mentioned, in this study, because of the fact that we put this together so quickly and because of the fact that we were working with a very uh, stressed population, we wanted Dynamica to have a very light footprint. So it really wasn't going to be acceptable to ask people to spend five or 10 or 15 minutes a day filling in information um, about their subjective well-being connected to their trips and activities. So we really used Dynamica primarily just as a way to try to understand people's daily activities. So what they were doing, when they were home, when they were at work, when they were shopping, when they were eating out, et cetera. So we didn't have any integrated surveys in the Dynamica app. All the surveys were done externally. Uh, we divided people into two groups. There were roughly half the participants consented to participate in, uh, in this Dynamica study, uh, this Dynamica sub-study, I should say. Um, we had those people split up into two groups and that they just differed in terms of when they started Dynamica data collection. One group was uh, started in December of 2020, um, did two weeks of Dynamica data collection in December of 2020, and then another two weeks in April of 2021. The second group started in April of 2021, did two weeks then, and then two weeks in August of 2021. And as I mentioned, the only thing that we asked of these participants, these healthcare workers, was that they should carry their smartphone and just use the Dynamica app, and the only interaction they were asked to do was to just label the nature of their trips and activities. So tell us which of your activities was a home activity, a work activity, shopping, eat out, et cetera. So we didn't ask for any survey responses, any self-reported well-being through the app. It was a relatively light footprint. So now I want to talk about sort of two of the challenges that we ran into in implementing this, this protocol. Um, so of the 95 participants who consented, uh, we had four participants who withdrew consent, fine. Uh, we had eight participants who provided no data, so we invited them with the activation email and they never responded to it. Uh, we had five participants who collected fewer than five days of data, and we had 14 participants who actually ran the app but didn't label any home or work episodes. So all we got were a sequence of locations and times with no actual labels for home or work activities. Uh, so compliance at that level was, you know, adequate, but not great. Um, one of the things that was a really interesting challenge is that because we were only asking participants to label home or work, we really weren't asking them to do a lot of interaction with the app. And so I think a lot just sort of forgot that they were using it. And so what happened is after we had about, you know, seven to 10 days of data collection in our first wave, 
we realized that over half of our participants had not actually labeled any of their home or work activities. And so we were well on our way to having a lot of really unlabeled information. And so the study manager reached out and contacted those participants and asked them to start labeling home and work activity partway through the data collection process. And so we thought, ah, well, that's not going to be great because we're going to be missing those first, say, seven to 10 days where people weren't labeling. But what we were actually able to do is we were able to then go back with those data and use the location information of those labeled, of those labeled home and work segments and go back and backfill the previous label. So we were able to sort of label the data that had not been labeled at the time based on the future labeling, right? So if somebody tells you where their home is 10 days into data collection, you can go back and label all their home episodes that took place in the same vicinity, right? Same thing going for work. So we were able to sort of recapture and refill um, a lot of data that we wouldn't have been able to get because we were able to get those labeled, uh, locate that labeled location information later on in the study, right? So that was sort of an interesting little um, thing that enabled us to increase data quality. The biggest challenge that we faced in this study was a, a challenge of data integration, or if you want to give it a sort of a more negative tone, uh, a misalignment of the schedule of data collection across all these different modalities. Uh, so this is kind of a representation of the way that we collected data. So we had these symptom surveys that asked people uh, what their symptoms of COVID-19 were in the previous 14 days, and those were filled out every two weeks. So we had a sort of an every two week pace for the symptom surveys. We had these mini Z surveys and they were given every six months. So we had a much rougher uh, measurement, much, much less high resolution measurement of stress um, in these healthcare workers at the sort of every six month level. Then we had these Dynamica data collection periods and those bars are probably longer than they should be, but they were two weeks, these two week data collection periods um, you know, roughly four months apart. And then we have information that we can get from public data sources about COVID prevalence. So one of the challenges we run into is kind of integrating, bringing all these different resolution of measurements together to try to do our analyses. Um, so for example, one thing that I'll tell you right now is that in hindsight, going back, I think we would have thought a lot more carefully about how often we wanted to assess stress levels because a, a mini Z survey every six months does not allow for a very tight linking to say a daily activity measure that we get from Dynamica, right? And so we felt like some of the, some of the findings or sort of lack of findings that we, uh, that we have perhaps might be due to the fact that this, these measurements were sort of done at a, ver a variety of different times and it was hard to kind of consolidate them all to create some kind of cohesive um, analysis. So analysis is ongoing. So all I have for you at the moment for this project are some preliminary findings. I'm not going to give you any numbers or any plots, but I will describe sort of some trends that we're seeing and describe some of the questions that we are starting to investigate using this Dynamica data. So the first question we were interested in attacking was whether healthcare workers daily activity patterns were related to COVID-19 symptoms. So for example, you might intuitively think that if healthcare workers were experiencing COVID-19 symptoms, they might be more likely to miss work and not go into work. Um, and so in order to assess that, we looked at the percentage of time spent at work or home or various other things um, in the past 14 days. That's from the Dynamica data that we were able to collect. And we matched that up against the symptom survey for that particular two week period, uh, the number of COVID-19 symptoms that occurred in the past 14 days. Now, sort of just quickly going back to this previous plot, you can see one of the limitations that we run into is that a lot of those symptom surveys do not occur during a Dynamica data collection period. So we can't really attach, we can't connect the symptoms to the time use except in those periods where Dynamica data was being collected, right? So again, something that we might have thought about if we'd had more time uh, to plan the study. Uh, what we found, or what we are finding, I should say, is that interestingly, there does not appear to be uh, much of a relationship between COVID-19 symptoms and time spent at work among healthcare workers. And in fact, there is a trend towards a small positive association with more symptoms being associated with, um, uh, with more time spent at work, which is kind of an anomalous uh, finding. We're kind of looking into some ways to explain it. Uh, and that, that seems to hold even if we adjust for the relative COVID-19 prevalence rate so that it's not explained by the fact that 
when there's more COVID in the community, doctors are asked to work more and may be more likely to have COVID-19 symptoms. So we tried to do some control uh, for confounding in that question. We've also been interested in looking at whether these daily activity patterns are related to the COVID-19 community prevalence. So for example, do healthcare workers spend less time eating out, less time shopping, more time at home if community COVID-19 levels rise? Um, and to do that, we looked at this, again, this percentage of time spent at home and work over the past 14 days, and then we can use this community, community COVID-19 prevalence case rate data that we can get from public data um, as a predictor. Um, and we find, again, interestingly, it doesn't seem like healthcare workers are particularly sensitive um, to COVID-19 community prevalence levels when making decisions about, about time use. Uh, you know, again, limited sample size, preliminary results, um, but somewhat interesting. And third, we wanted to know whether healthcare workers' daily activity patterns were related to stress or burnout. So did more work time relate to higher levels of stress, um, more time spent at home, lower levels of stress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and in order to do that, we looked at this mini Z stress or burnout score as an outcome and looked at this percentage of time at home or work um, or other activities um, as a predictor. And you'll see a trend here. You know, the answer again seems to be no for a lot of these questions. Uh, healthcare workers with high stress or burnout do not appear to, to, to have substantially different activity patterns from those with low stress or burnout levels. Again, preliminary, we're looking into what might explain some of these results, um, but these are some of the questions that we can kind of answer with uh, this Dynamica technology. So just to wrap up, I want to pass on a couple of things that I think we, we sort of learned uh, or that we've learned so far in the study outside of the actual concrete results. Um, the first is, has this nice cute uh, rhyming name, Align by Design. And so I think that, again, if we had gone back and had more time to think about the design of the study, I think we would have tried to link uh, stress measures, the, the, the frequency at which we measured stress, the frequency at which we measured symptoms, we would, tr would have tried to align that better with the Dynamica data collection. Because oftentimes, we, had this ver we have very detailed Dynamica data that we had to summarize up to very rough measures and as to associate them and align them with these relatively infrequent measures that we took. And I think if we had done this again, we might have tried to get higher resolution, more frequent measures of some of these things so that we could have leveraged the Dynamica data uh, better. The second lesson is that even in a situation where we are doing very passive data collection and not asking users to interact substantially with, um, uh, with the app, there's still a need for fairly active management by a study manager to make sure that people are uh, at least keeping the app on and are labeling what they're supposed to label because in a situation where you're asking people to do very little with the app, it's very easy for them to almost forget that they're using it. Right? So there's, a, there's still a need to do some, uh, to do some study management, even if, you're asking, even if the app has a relatively uh, light footprint. So that's all I have, and I'd be happy to take um, any questions. Thank you, Julie. And any questions from the audience? Uh, great presentation, thank you. Uh, I'm Sam Gailey, I'll be presenting later. I had a question about your, you know, you mentioned a little bit about confounding. Um, and of course that's a risk when you have these uh, not very temporally fine measurements. I'm curious, what, what, kind, of, um, what kind of control could you do? What kind, of, um, what kind of models did you design to try to rule out reverse causality that you know, there, there's more COVID in, in, in the community, it's obviously healthcare workers, they are as such you know, on demand. Um, and then may, as a result, have symptoms. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of different ways you could uh, think about the arrows there. Yeah, and I think that, again, some of that could have been best addressed by some smarter design decisions uh, at, the, at the initial phase. I think that's totally true. Um, one thing that's kind of related to that, which sort of, is, again, is an interesting element of where a little bit of extra knowledge and thought would have gone a long way, uh, one of the things that we were not able to distinguish was the difference between somebody who wasn't at work because they simply took a vacation and were not scheduled to work that day versus somebody who did not work because they were sick and chose not to go in because of symptoms. Um, it would not have been too difficult probably to ask a question 
to try to elucidate that difference, but we didn't. And so we don't really have a good way to distinguish those two things. So yes, there's no question that there's a challenge with reverse causality. In our analyses, we've tried to account for things that might account for it, levels of uh, you know, community prevalence, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think in a design like this, it may be challenging to really ever fully rule out reverse causality, especially when you have these relatively rough, infrequent measures, and then you have to roll up daily measures up to something that's at the 14 days or up to a you know, six-month level, uh, I think you have those, those challenges will remain. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Julianne.